Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today, I am going to talk about the anatomy of prostate gland. A patient aged about 65 years visits a doctor complaining of difficulty in passing urine. The doctor, after listening to his complaints, does a pararectal examination. The patient is puzzled. He tells doctor, I complained of urinary disturbances and you are examining my anal canal. How does it hold good here? Doctor says, no, certain organs which are present inside can be felt through the rectum by doing a digital examination. That's why I'm trying to see whether you have an enlarged prostate, which is a senile condition resulting or affecting most of the men. So let's look at the normal anatomy of this prostate gland. Today's lecture will be under the following headings. An interaction to prostate, where it is located, what are its gross features and relations, capsule and ligaments related to it, structures which pass through the prostate, lobes of prostate and actual microstructure of prostate, its zonal anatomy, functions of prostate, age changes which take place in the prostate, its blood supply, lymphatic drainage, nerve supply and we will end with applied anatomy and summarize the whole thing in the end. What is this prostate? Prostate is an accessory male reproductive organ. Please note, it is an accessory male reproductive organ. It is present in the lesser pelvis. It is of the size of a chest nut, which is, it appears like an inverted cone. It is compressed from above downwards, measuring about 3 centimeters in height, 4 centimeters in width at the base and anterior posteriorly it measures about 2 centimeters in thickness. So, you find this prostate is again another organ in the body which has a lesser length compared to the width. If we can recall from our earlier uh, lectures, we will know that there are few organs in the body which can have a lesser height compared to the width. So, prostate is one of these and we can remember this with the help of the mnemonic 3PC out of which one P stands for prostate and the other two is pons and pituitary whereas C is the cecum. These organs in the body have a lesser height compared to the width. Now, let us look where this prostate is situated. Prostate is situated in the lesser pelvis. It is below the neck of the urinary bladder, above the urogenital diaphragm. It is behind the lower half of the pubis and in front of the rectal ampulla. This is where the prostate is situated. On either side is the levator ani. So, we know this prostate is of the chestnut shape with a compressed inverted cone like appearance. It has an anterior surface which we can see here, a posterior surface, anterior surface is much more convex transversely when compared to the posterior surface which is flatter. It has a base above and an apex below. Apex is directed towards the urethra that is the lowermost end of the prostate apex. This is the base. In a coronal section, you can make out two more surfaces. These surfaces, they are the inferolateral surfaces of the prostate. And you can see the prosthetic urethra passing through the prostate here. Posterior surface, you can see some more features in this diagram. You can see a transverse sulcus dividing the posterior surface into an upper smaller part and a lower larger part. And this transverse sulcus will have on either side of the midline the ejaculatory ducts piercing the prostate and entering. The smaller upper part is formed by the median lobe 
and you find this lower larger part is again divided into two halves by a vertical median sulcus. And this posterior median sulcus will separate the two lateral lobes, one on either side. Now, let us look at the relations of these surfaces. You find the anterior surface which is convex related anteriorly to the lower half of the symphysis pubis. It is separated from the pubis by a space which is called as retropubic space of redzius. And in this, you will find two ligaments which are attached to prostate on the posterior end and to the symphysis pubis and the lateral part in the anterior end. So, you find this uh, upper one is the lateral puboprostatic ligament and the lower one is the medial puboprostatic ligament. The lateral puboprostatic ligament is attached to the base of the prostate, whereas the medial puboprostatic ligament is attached to the neck of the prostate. It connects the prostate anteriorly to the pubis. The retropubic space which separates prostate from the symphysis pubis is filled with fat and also there is dorsal venous plexus of Santorini dorsal venous plexus of Santorini. This is Santorini plexus which is contributed by the deep dorsal vein of penis. It communicates posteriorly with the prostate. So, we call this as Santorini plexus present in the retropubic space of Redzius along with the puboprostatic ligaments and the fat. That is about the anterior surface of the prostate. The lower end of the anterior surface just in front of the apex of the prostate, you find the opening of the urethra. The prostatic urethra will open in the lower part of the anterior surface just anterior superior to the apex of the prostate. Next coming to the base of the prostate, it is adjacent to the urinary bladder and the part of the urinary bladder related to it is the neck of the urinary bladder. The two are separated by a sulcus which will have the prostatic and the venous plexus, the vesicle venous plexus which will communicate across this sulcus. Posteriorly, prostate is related to the rectal ampulla. This is the rectum and the lower part dilated part is called as the rectal ampulla. So, prostate is separated from this rectal ampulla by a facial sheath which is running downwards and forwards. This facial sheath is called as rectovesicle fascia of denonvillier, rectovesicle fascia of denonvillier. This rectovesicle fascia of denonvillier will extend from the rectovesicle pouch of peritoneum to the perineal body. Initially during development, you find the rectovesicle pouch extending downwards till the perineal body. But later with development, you find this starts obliterating from below upwards, thereby forming a facial sheath by the union of the two layers of the peritoneum and you find the floor of the rectovesicle pouch moves upwards and this facial sheath formed is the rectovesicle fascia of denonvillier. Next you find inferiorly the prostate is related to urogenital diaphragm. Urogenital diaphragm here has the transverse perineal muscles and the sphincter urethrae and the superior layer of urogenital diaphragm will separate these muscles from the prostate. That is about the anterior, posterior, superior and inferior relations of prostate. When we look at the inferolateral surface of the prostate, you find that is related to this muscle which is present here and that muscle is levator A9. It is covered by a fascia from the pelvic fascia, parietal layer of pelvic fascia covering levator A9 will separate the bladder from a space which is lateral to it. This space, this is the anterior recess of the ischiorectal fossa anterior recess of ischiorectal fossa. 
So, you find the base is towards the bladder and the apex is towards the urogenital diaphragm resting on it. Anterior surface is uh, in front of the apex is where the urethra pierces and on either side is the levator ani. So, these are some of the relations of the prostate. The same relations can be appreciated in a transverse section. You can see the section of the prostate with the prostatic urethra passing through it. Surrounding the prostate is a capsule and surrounding this is a facial sheath with anteriorly placed Santorini's dorsal venous plexus and the puboprostatic ligaments. The medial puboprostatic and the lateral puboprostatic ligaments connecting the anterior surface of the prostate with the symphysis pubis and the pubic bone. Laterally is this muscle, the levator ani covered by its fascia and that will be the pelvic fascia parietal layer. Posteriorly is the rectum separated from the prostate by a layer of fascia which is called as rectovesicle fascia of denonvillier and this posteriorly it is related to the pre-rectal fat. You can also see posteriorly prostate is related to two more structures. The medial ones are the ejaculatory ducts formed by the union of the vas deferens which is present medially with the seminiferous tubules which are present laterally. Lateral to this towards the lateral edge of the posterior surface you will find a neurovascular bundle running in the fascia. So, these are some of the relations of the prostate. Now, let us look at the coverings of the prostate. The coverings of the prostate are arranged as its capsule and ligaments. We find the capsule of prostate in the form of uh, two layers, a true capsule and a false capsule. Now, this blue area is the prostate covered by a true capsule which is the condensation of the stroma of the gland itself and outer to this is a false capsule which is formed from the surrounding pelvic fascia and the uh, facial sheets of various organs related to prostate. In between these two capsules you find a plexus of veins sections of which are seen here and this is the prostatic venous plexus. This becomes an important relation in prostate because the venous plexus is between the true capsule and the false capsule. So, what do we do? We leave behind both the capsules when we are doing a prostatectomy. Enucleation is done by removing the prostate leaving behind both capsules and it is not removed along with the capsules. So, that the plexus will be kept intact, there will not be much of a bleeding. Here we can see the capsule of the prostate becomes continuous anteriorly with the puboprostatic ligaments and posteriorly with the fascia of denonvillier. It merges here with these two structures. Inferiorly, it merges with the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. The puboprostatic ligaments extending from the anterior surface to the pubis is again appreciated here with the fascia of denonvillier and in between the fascia of denonvillier and the levator ani, you will find a facial sheath. So, the fascia of denonvillier which is going to this facial sheath will divide this into two parts, an anterior part in relation to the prostate, so it is called as lateral prostatic fascia and a posterior part which is related to the rectum, so it is called as lateral rectal fascia and anteriorly it becomes continuous with the endopelvic fascia lining the parietal wall. Now, let us look at the structures within the prostate gland. You find three structures present or passing through the prostate gland. Most important one is the urethra. This is the prostatic urethra. The proximal portion of this is pre-prostatic and the remaining is called as prostatic urethra. It starts or enters the gland in the base as a continuation of the external urethral orifice from the as a continuation of the internal urethral orifice 
from the urinary bladder it becomes continuous with the prostatic urethra and here this part the junction is called as pre-prostatic urethra. So, you find this entering the base of the prostate gland at the junction of anterior one third and posterior two third. So, it lies more towards the anterior surface. The urethra descends down through the gland and comes out of the prostate to become continuous with the next part of the urethra called as the membranous urethra. Here it is coming out through the anterior surface of the gland anterior superior to the apex. So, it is not coming out through the apex, but it is coming out slightly anterior superior to the apex in the anterior surface to become continuous with the membranous urethra. You find another structure which is present within the prostate, this is called as prostatic utricle. Prostatic utricle is about 6 millimeters in length, it is a cul-de-sac, a blind ending pouch protruding upwards and backwards from the prostatic urethra posteriorly in the midline. The presence of this prostatic utricle is used as a landmark to demarcate the median lobe. So, you find the median lobe present above the prostatic utricle which is in the midline. On either side you find it the prostatic utricle is related to the ejaculatory ducts. This is again another structure which is present within the prostate. The ejaculatory ducts will enter the prostate from its posterior surface, will pass obliquely to reach a position to lie on either side of the prostatic utricle. So, posteriorly you will find two structures behind the urethra, one is the prostatic utricle and the other structure is ejaculatory ducts which is a pair of ejaculatory ducts, one on either side of prostatic utricle. This prostatic utricle I told you is a 6 millimeter length cul-de-sac, it is having a mu lining of mucosa with fibrous tissue covering it, it is supposed to represent the pro, uh, uterus part in the or homologue in the uh, male and it is so it is called as prostatic utricle. It is supposed to be developing from the paramesonephric duct or the urogenital sinus. Occasionally it is also thought to represent the homologue of vagina. So, it is also called as vaginalis masculina or the prostatic utricle. The ejaculatory ducts which are passing obliquely downwards are passing uh, from the posterior surface to the prostatic urethra. They are formed by the union of the vas difference and the seminal vesicle. These two will join together to form the ejaculatory ducts which enters the prostate and opens into the prostatic urethra. So, these are the three structures present within the prostate. To repeat the prostatic urethra, the prostatic utricle and a pair of ejaculatory ducts. Let us look at the features in the prostatic urethra. You find the prostatic urethra is a tubular structure with a lumen. The posterior wall of the lumen shows an elevation which is called as urethral crest. It is present throughout the prostatic urethra. So, prostatic urethra on transverse section appears to be semi lunar in shape with a slight projection from the posterior wall. This is formed by the urethral crest. Center of the urethral crest you find an enlarged rounded elevation. This is called as colliculus seminalis. Colliculus seminalis, this is the area, colliculus seminalis. The other name for colliculus seminalis is Veru Montanum. Veru montanum. That is the other name for colliculus seminalis, which is a rounded projection on the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra. On the middle of the veru montanum or the colliculus seminalis, you find the opening of the cul-de-sac that is the prostatic utricle. 
On either side of the prostatic utricle, you will find the opening of ejaculatory ducts. So, center is the prostatic utricle opening, on either side is the opening of the ejaculatory ducts. Occasionally, the ejaculatory ducts will open into the prostatic utricle itself. Lateral to the urethral crest and the colliculus seminalis, you will find a depression, a linear depression or a groove which is called as prostatic sinus on either side of the urethral crest and the colliculus seminalis. This linear depression is called as prostatic sinus and this will receive the openings of the prostatic ducts. About 15 to 20 prostatic ducts will open into this sinus, that is the prostatic sinus. Now, let us look at the lobes of prostate. Earlier, it was thought that prostate had 5 lobes anatomically. The surgeons thought there were 3 lobes. The anatomical lobes which were expressed earlier were an anterior lobe in front of the urethra, a median lobe above the prostatic utricle and the ejaculatory ducts in front of it, two lateral lobes on either side of the prostatic urethra connected posteriorly by a posterior lobe below the prostatic utricle and the ejaculatory ducts. So, this part is the anterior lobe in front of the urethra, this part is the median lobe above and medial to the prostatic utricle and the ejaculatory ducts behind the prostatic urethra and this in the midline is the posterior lobe connecting the two sides lateral lobes. When we look at a coronal section or a transverse section, this is what it appears like. So, in a transverse section, you will find the prostatic urethra which is crescent shaped with the verumontanum projecting forwards. In front of it is the anterior lobe, on either side is the lateral lobe and posterior to it in the upper part will be median and in the lower part will be posterior lobe. The anterior lobe is found only in the initial period of uh, childhood, later of about after about 6 years of age it gets converted into a fibromuscular stroma which covers the anterior surface of the gland. This lobar anatomy which was seen as five lobes initially in case of uh, anatomical classification is no more followed. Now, what they feel is only during the fetal life period prostate shows five lobes, but beyond 20 weeks of gestation up to benign prostatic hypertrophy, what you find is only three lobes out of which two are lateral and one is median. The earlier surgical classification is what is followed even anatomically now. Let us look at the structure of the prostate. Prostate is made up of three different structures. It is a fibromusculoglandular organ. So, it has fibers, it has muscles and it has glandular tissue. The fibers and the muscles will form the fibromuscular stroma and this stroma is present as a thick part in the anterior part of the gland. You also find the fibromuscular stroma intervening between the glandular tissue in the posterior and lateral aspects of the gland. This fibromuscular stroma will have both the sympathetic and the somatic nerve supply, the contraction of these muscles will help in dilatation of the prostatic urethra and squeezing of the glands, so that the prostatic secretions are poured into the prostatic urethra. The glandular part is arranged in the three forms, the mucosal glands which are simple not with showing much branching simple ducts opening into the urethra all around. Next is the submucosal glands which show tubular glands with little bit of branching, the ducts opening into the prostatic urethra at the level of seminal colliculus and the main glands which occupy the lateral aspect and the posterior aspect of the gland, these main glands will open into the prostatic sinus. 
on either side of the urethral crest and the verumontanum or the colliculus seminalis. At present, there are three zones of prostate which become much more important surgically. We find a zone which is present on the outermost part of the prostate which is called as peripheral zone. It is like in the form of a cup and this cup shaped structure is present on either side laterally and posteriorly. Anteriorly it is connected by the fibromuscular stroma. This peripheral zone contributes for 70 percent of the gland and this part of the prostate is prone for carcinoma. So, most of the carcinoma will arise in the peripheral zone of the prostate. The next zone what you find is the central zone which develops from the Wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct which gives rise to the other structures in the male genital tract like the epididymis, the seminal vesicle, vas deferens and the ejaculatory ducts all these are derived from the Wolfian duct. Similar to those structures you find the central zone of prostate developing from the Wolfian duct. The central zone of prostate is almost pyramidal shaped with an apex which is directed towards the verumontanum and it has the ejaculatory duct passing through it. So, it surrounds the ejaculatory duct. You find another zone the transitional zone which surrounds the preprostatic urethra forming about 5 percent of the gland. This zone is prone for benign prostatic hypertrophy a senile condition which can result in all the males benign prostatic hypertrophy seen in the transitional zone. Let us look at the functions of the prostate. Prostate contributes to 10 percent of seminal fluid. The secretions of prostate are acidic in nature because it contains citric acid, acid phosphatase, prostaglandins, zinc, prostate specific antigen and beta microseminoprotein. Some of these products effect on sperm motility is beneficial like for example, zinc helps in transportation of the sperms through the female genital tract, but the same zinc can have harmful effect on the prostate itself because it aids bacterial inflammation of the prostate. Role of some of these products are not known. Next looking on to the eight changes of the prostate, before birth you find epithelial hyperplasia and squamous metaplasia in case of prostate. This is due to the effect of circulating maternal estrogen. After birth it subsides and the stroma is filled with simple duct system. This stays up to 12 to 14 years of age and this is the period of quiescence. At puberty that is by about 14 to 18 years it starts maturing. So, this is the maturation phase where you see the prostate doubles in size and there is follicular development. The follicular epithelium will start projecting into the lumen showing foldings. The foldings increase by 20 to 30 years of age. Now, they become irregular epithelial infoldings which is characteristic of prostate. 30 to 45 years it is constant in size, beyond 45 years it starts involution whereby the follicles become regular, the irregular epithelial infoldings will start regressing. So, you do not see much of the infoldings, follicular size becomes regular and lastly you find beyond 50 years of age BPH becomes inevitable that is benign prostatic hypertrophy seen in elderly males. Coming to the arterial supply of prostate, it is supplied by branches coming from the internal iliac artery. The inferior vesicle artery is a major artery supplying the prostate 
It also receives branches from the internal pudendal artery and the middle rectal artery. When you look at the branches of inferior vesicle, they form a plexus surrounding the capsule. This plexus called as subcapsular plexus supplies about two thirds of the prostate. Whereas some of the branches will reach the urethra forming periurethral plexus. This supplies the inner one third of the prostate and this becomes important while doing a transurethral resection of prostate. Prostatic venous plexus as we have already seen lies between the true capsule of the prostate and the false capsule. This prostatic venous plexus will communicate anteriorly with the deep dorsal vein of penis and it communicates superiorly with the vesicle venous plexus. So, this prostatic venous plexus will drain into the internal iliac veins which gets continued as common iliac and the inferior vena cava. These prostatic veins also communicate with internal vertebral venous plexus of Batson through some veins which pass through the lateral sacral foramina. So, whenever there is any carcinoma of prostate, metastasis via the veins can happen through the internal vertebral venous plexus and reach the vertebral column and the skull. So, when we see the prostatic venous plexus communicating with the internal vertebral venous plexus of Batson via the veins passing through the lateral sacral foramina can help in carrying the carcinomatous cells bringing about metastasis into the vertebral body or the skull. The lymphatics are mainly ending in external iliac lymph nodes along with the vesicle veins internal iliac lymph nodes along with the veins draining the mem uh, vessels draining the membranous urethra and lastly sacral nodes or the obturator nodes. So, the vessels accompany the vesicle vessels and reach external iliac nodes accompanying the membranous uh, urethral vessels they end in the internal iliac nodes other nodes are lateral uh, placed obturator nodes and medially placed posteriorly sacral nodes. So, these are the nodes involved in the lymphatic drainage of the prostate. Coming to the nerve supply of prostate, both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves supply prostate. What we find is the sympathetic arising from L1 and L2, parasympathetic nerves arising from S2, S3 and S4 will take part in the formation of inferior hypogastric plexus. This plexus will give nerve fibers which form a plexus in the posterior lateral part of the prostate and the bladder. They form what is called as periprostatic plexus. From this maximum number of fibers will be supplying the preprostatic urethral sphincter. You also find the neurovascular bundle closely associated with the posterior lateral aspect of the prostate. This lies within the fascia of this region. The neurovascular bundle present here will supply the prostate and along with this it supplies the vas difference, the epididymis, the seminal vesicle, the ejaculatory duct, the prostatic membranous and the penile urethra corpora cavernosa and corpora spongiosa other than the prostate. So, what happens is this neurovascular bundle should be kept in mind while doing prostatectomy because injury to this bundle can result in impotence because of the nerve supply lost to various other organs supplied by these nerves. Next looking on to the clinical anatomy of prostate. The suffix itis added to prostate is the word which is used to indicate inflammation of the prostate. It is called as prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate. Prostate is enlarged, it is inflamed showing all the other features of inflammation. 
benign prostatic hypertrophy is a condition age related so found in elderly males usually it is present it can be with symptoms or without symptoms in case of benign prostatic hypertrophy it is usually the median lobe which is enlarged and this median lobe which forms the uvula vesicae in the floor of the trigone of the urinary bladder you find this enlarged to a maximum extent so what happens is there is a small pouch like area in the bladder behind the median lobe so this area will start collecting the urine and this urine gets stagnated here so you find this stagnation of urine forming a post prostatic pouch in the urinary bladder and this is due to enlarged median lobe in the region of the uvula vesicae which acts as a ball valve to close the sphincter here or the orifice here benign prostatic hypertrophy or any other uh, cause of enlargement we can make out the enlarged prostate by doing a digital examination and what we do is the per rectal uh, digital examination to feel the prostate prostate posterior surface is felt about 4 cm above the anal opening and it is felt like a firm mass and if it is hard and fixed or nodular then carcinoma should be ruled out we already told which zones are involved in the diseases so you find the peripheral zone is involved in carcinoma whereas the transitional zone is involved in benign prostatic hypertrophy benign prostatic hypertrophy starts as micro nodules small nodules in the region of the median lobe or the transitional zone later they coalesce and enlarge in size to form a bigger mass in case of benign prostatic hypertrophy so what happens is the surrounding peripheral zone gets compressed and it forms a capsule to surround this irregular mass present within so you find a capsule being formed since it's not the original capsule it is also called a surgical pseudo capsule because you use this as a guide during surgery when you want to do enucleation of the prostate that is removal of the prostate without cutting you can use this capsule the surgical pseudo capsule as a guide to enucleate the mass within enlargement of the prostate due to any cause will cause urethral compression because that's a membranous structure present within the prostate so it gets compressed easily and can be compressed by benign prostatic hypertrophy or carcinoma this narrow urethra will result in urethral disturbances like frequency of micturition difficulty in passing urine nocturia where the person gets up many times in the night to pass urine because of stagnation of urine etc enlarged prostate has to be removed if it results then it causes urinary disturbance so enlarged prostate can be approached through any of the routes it can be approached through the bladder when it is called as transvesical approach it can be approached behind the pubis then it will be called as retropubic approach it can be approached through the perineum which is called as transperineal and lastly through the urethra then it is called as transurethral approach commonly used approach now is the transurethral approach it's called as transurethral resection of prostate turp so with this we complete the applied aspects related to prostate to summarize it's an accessory gland of male reproductive system it is a fibromusculoglandular organ situated below the neck of the urinary bladder the urethra passes through it and that part of the urethra is called as prostatic urethra and it has a transitional zone which is prone for benign prostatic hypertrophy and a zone in the periphery called as peripheral zone which is prone for carcinomatous change prostate can be easily examined by doing a per rectal examination and removal of the prostate nowadays commonly used procedure is transurethral resection of prostate or turp thank you